So the Lord is using his word in the running quarter language, and we thank him for that. Open your Bible, if you would, tonight to Romans chapter 15. <clears throat> Romans chapter 15. I just want to look at one verse with you. And then we're going to do uh, tonight a presentation called The Status of the Mission. <clears throat> the Status of the Mission. I, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that in just a minute, but I want to start with this verse, Romans 15. You can throw the entry slide up there if you would. And let's uh, check this, make sure it's working. Hey, it looks like it might work. All right. It's great when the technology cooperates, isn't it, Brother Ogle? Yeah. Sometimes you can practice with the technology and it forgets its part. But we, we think it's going to work tonight. Praise the Lord. I want to share the verse with you that is kind of a guide for our ministry, Romans 15, verse 20. Paul says, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. And I don't have time to, to walk through this scripture tonight, but the church today must have a strategy to get the gospel where the gospel hasn't been. And I don't know about you, but I grew up in church, and I kind of grew up with the idea that there's missionaries everywhere, and there's churches everywhere, and there's Bibles everywhere. And I know not everybody's saved, but we're getting the gospel around the world. And a few years ago, I began learning that that's far from the truth, that there aren't missionaries everywhere. So what we're going to talk about tonight is, uh, you rec do you recall what I said this morning when I talked about the, the fact that God is on a mission to reveal His glory and extend His grace to every kindred, tribe, and tongue. I, I hope you'll remember that. I, I might have it here in just a moment on the screen. I'm not, I can't remember if it's up there or not. But God is on a mission to reveal His glory and extend His grace to every kindred, tribe, and tongue. That's the work God is engaged in. It's the work He started at the beginning of time. Psalm, I'm sorry, Genesis 1.1 is, is God created the heaven and the earth, and you know what creation does? It declares the glory of God. So from the first verse of the Bible, God's revealing Himself. And from the first chapter of the Bible, God is creating a people for Himself. So in Genesis 1, we see the mission of God beginning with His glory declared and, and His extending grace to Adam and Eve. Now, I think God could have created this world and enjoyed it forever all by Himself, and He would still be God, wouldn't He? But He wanted people. He wanted to show His grace to a people who would become His people, and who would love Him and serve Him and fellowship with Him and know Him personally. And so that's what God's been doing from Genesis 1, and that's what He's going to do all the way until the time we stand at the throne of God in Revelation 7-9 with people from every kindred, tribe, and tongue. That's the work God is doing. If that is the work God is doing, then how's it going? How is the mission advancing around the world? So here's what I think is going to happen tonight. I'm going to give you a lot of statistics and facts and figures, <clears throat> and they're going to be overwhelming, especially if you've never heard any of this stuff. It's going to overwhelm your heart. And the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to respond like I did when I first began to learn about this. You're going to say, we'll never get that job done. It's just too big of a job. But the last thing I want to leave you with is, how possible it is for us to reach the world. So I'm not going to leave you hopeless tonight, okay? I want to send you out with hope, but I do want us to know and be aware of what this world looks like as it relates to the advance of the gospel. So there's my statement. I should have clicked one more, and there it is. Take a picture of it, write it down, because this is the framework by which God operates, and this is the framework by which we ought to see our lives. Okay, everybody got it? Why don't you read it out loud with me, would you? Ready? Ready? God is on a mission to reveal His glory and extend His grace to every kindred, tribe, and tongue. If that's the mission of God, <clears throat> what do you think the church here ought to be focused on? Proclaiming the glory of God and declaring the gospel of His grace to as many people as we possibly can in every part of this world and finishing the task of the Great Commission. The Lord never gave us a, a, a command that can't be obeyed, right? Right? Uh, God didn't say go reach the world knowing it was impossible for us to do it. He gave us this commission and it is possible. So, here's what we're going to do tonight. I just talked about that so I'll skip that part. But God has given the church to this mission. 
I preached about this a little bit this morning, but some folks really do have the idea that in a last-minute addendum, just before Jesus went back to heaven, he said, uh, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. So, right before Jesus went back to heaven, he had to come up with something to keep the disciples busy. So, he gave the Great Commission. No, it wasn't a last-minute addendum. The mission started in Genesis 1, and the church was established to continue the unfolding drama of God's redemption. William Graham Scroggie wrote a commentary. It's about that thick. It's called The Unfolding Drama of Redemption. And that's what God's been doing in this world. And he established this church for the purpose of carrying out the mission. So the questions we need to ask tonight is, have we taken the gospel to the whole world? Does everybody have a Bible in their language? Uh, is, is, uh, are we really taking the Great Commission seriously? Are we, do we have a strategy to get to the parts of the world that are still waiting? <clears throat> we're going to cover four areas tonight. We're going to cover languages and scripture. And we're going to talk about people groups. Then we're going to talk about missionaries. And then we're going to talk about the solution to finishing the task. Okay, let's start with languages and scripture. How many of you, would any one of you remember the total number of languages that are spoken in the world? Not specifically, but there are over... 7,000. I heard it right over there. Good. I said it last night very quickly, and I told you you wouldn't be quizzed, so no grade. You're fine. 7,378 languages spoken in the world. Out of that huge number of languages, how many of you, this is the first time you ever heard that many? You had no idea there were 7,000 languages. Anybody? Several hands, okay. Only 717 of those have a whole Bible. That's, that's, un, uh, that's unacceptable, folks. It really is. Uh, 1,582 have a New Testament, and 1,196 have a portion of Scripture, like maybe the Gospel of John, and that leaves 3,883 languages currently that still do not have one verse of Scripture. I, I love this book right here, don't you? Uh, it's called The Word of God, and that's an accurate phrase, but I like to use this phrase, this is a word from God. And that makes it a little personal, doesn't it? When I open this book, I'm reading a word from God. And there are 3,883 language groups on this earth who've never heard a word from God in their own language. It's unacceptable. And we have, we have to change that number. And we're working on that with your prayers and your help. Uh, there are about 3,000 of these languages are still unwritten. And you say, what in the world do you do with an unwritten language? Just a very simple overview of it. You, for an unwritten language, you begin by compiling a dictionary. You just begin defining words. You, be, you have to start learning the language, and then you can sit down with somebody who speaks it, and you can say, what's your word for floor, and what's your word for ceiling, and what's your word for air, and what's the word for blue, and what's just on and on. And you have to write a dictionary, defining all their words. And, and you use the, what's called the International Phonetic Alphabet which is 36 characters. Most of them look like the letters in our English alphabet, the Roman script. <clears throat> and, and those 36 characters can write down, can express any sound produced by any language in the world. So once you've done that with the International Phonetic Alphabet, you've created this dictionary, now you have to convert that to a localized script. So if you're in Central Asia, you might use the Cyrillic script because they're used to seeing Russian, the Russian language. That's Cyrillic. If you're in a South Asian country, you might use the Devanagari script because they're used to seeing Hindi. You know, all those squiggly little lines. And there's a whole bunch of scripts, and I can't name all of them for sure. Um, but you might use the Roman script. You might have to use the Arabic script. We think in our Pamiri project uh, that I talked about the eight different languages that are unwritten, when we finish our first one in the Waki language, we may be printing that same New Testament in the Arabic script, the Cyrillic script, and the Devanagari script of, of uh, Indian languages, our Sino-Tibetan languages. And so you have to convert it to a script now, and then you can begin the process of translation, and along with that, you're gonna have to write primers to teach people how to read their own language because it's never been in print before. And literacy training has to be part of Bible translation. I firmly believe in the necessity of the written Word of God. There are Bible translation organizations today that as quickly as they possibly can, they get somebody who can understand a different language than their own, 
and they get them to read it and speak into a microphone and translate it into their own language, and that's what they produce as scripture. That's not how you translate the Bible, okay? But then they only produce the audio form because their goal is let's do this just as fast as we possibly can. We want to do it fast. We, we've got to do it accurately because we're, we're talking about the Word of God. You, ha you cannot be careless with the Word of God. The words of this book are important, aren't they? So it requires a lot of work and a lot of time. So how many are ready to sign up? All right. <clears throat> Here's a breakdown of different continents. Uh, for example, in the African continent, there's a thousand, at the bottom of that, of the second column, a thousand ninety-nine languages with no scripture. And the most un, uh, languages without scripture are in the continent of Asia with 1,462. So, would you agree with me that's an unac unacceptable number? And we need, we need to get busy, don't we? Okay, let's talk about people groups. The Bible says in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now the word nations doesn't mean political countries. It, it's not talking about the U.S. and Mexico and, and uh, Nicaragua and Honduras and Ecuador and, and Canada. We're not talking about countries. We're talking about ethnic groups. The word nations in the New Testament, almost every time, if not every time, it means Gentiles or ethnic peoples. The word, the word uh, nations actually is the word ethne. So when God says go teach all nations, he's talking about all the different ethnic groups that are, are, um, that are around the world. So here's a definition of an ethnic group or a people group. It's a group of individuals with a common language, religion, culture, and ethnic background. When it comes to the idea of planting the church or, or spreading the gospel, it is the largest group within which the gospel can be spread as a church planning movement without encountering the barriers of cultural acceptance and understanding. Let me illustrate that for you if I can. In Papua New Guinea, I have a friend serving there. His name is John Allen. And John went to <clears throat> the Kamea people of Papua New Guinea. And by the way, Papua New Guinea is the most linguistically diverse country in the world. There's over 850 languages spoken in that small country. But he went to the Kamea tribe, and let's say that, that John preaches the gospel, and this young man gets saved, and he's discipled in the faith, and this young man feels the call of the Lord and the burden of God to go spread the gospel somewhere else. And you can look across the mountains, and it'll take you about four days to get over there because there's no roads. But he says to my friend, uh, I want to go over and preach the gospel in the next, the next village. And John says, you go. We'll help you. We'll support you. We'll provide whatever you need. And so he heads to the next village and he gets over there and he finds out they can't understand his language. That's a cultural barrier. That's an acceptance barrier that has to be crossed in order for the gospel to spread among that people group. Does that make sense? So when it comes to church planning, a people group is the largest number of people that can receive the gospel without bumping into these barriers of language or ethnicity or cultural understanding. So, according to missions research, and I'm not the one who did all this research, but I'm glad to benefit from it, there's 17,432 nations in the world. 17,432 people groups. There are 10,000 of those, approximately, that are considered reached. There are 7,416 of those that are considered unreached. And then there's approximately 3,200 of those that are considered unengaged. Now, let me define those words for you, reached, unreached, and unengaged. <clears throat> the word reached doesn't mean saved. I can tell you, based on this miss missions research, that, what's this, this county? Delaware. Delaware County, okay. Delaware County is reached with the gospel. That doesn't mean everybody in this county is saved, because you know lost people around here, right? It doesn't even mean that everybody in this county has heard the gospel, but we are reached with the gospel, meaning this, we have access to it. This church is here. Anybody in Delaware County can find this church and hear the gospel. You can go to Walmart and buy a Bible. So, and, and this isn't the only church that preaches the gospel around here. There's, there's lots of churches that do in this, in this surrounding area. So this is a reached area. So let me define unreached like this. Technically speaking, it means less than 2% of the people uh, are, are identified as, as evangelical Christian, 
and they don't have sufficient resources to begin or sustain church planting efforts. Now, the word Christian in mission research includes a lot of groups. Christian doesn't mean independent fundamental Baptist, okay? It doesn't even mean born again believer. The word Christian includes Catholics, it includes apostolics, it includes orthodox, it includes Anglican, and some places they even throw in the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. Basically, if you're not Islamic, Buddhist, or Hindu, you're thrown in the Christian category. So when it says 2%, that doesn't mean 2% of the people are saved, born again believers. But technically speaking, an unreached people group is when less than 2% of their people claim to be Christian. Practically speaking, it means they have no access to the gospel or the, to the Bible. Uh, everybody in Delaware County has access, but there's places all over the world, there's no place to go. There's no church anywhere near them. There's no Bible they can read. There's no missionary planning a church anywhere near where they live. The only hope they have of getting the gospel is if someone comes from the outside and brings it to them, or they leave where they are and move to a different part of the world. That's considered an unreached group. Unengaged mean, means there's no church planting strategy underway consistent with the evangelical faith and practice, which is what we are. We're evangelical Christians. There's no church planting strategy underway. So here's the, here's the saddest part. There's 7,416 people groups that are unreached, and out of that, about 3,200 of them, nobody's coming. They're just out there waiting. There's no missionary on deputation to go there. Now you, you, have, you have to ask this question, why is that true? There's a lot, of, a lot of reasons we could give, but there's no good reasons. There's no good excuses, right? You ever try to give an excuse to your teacher in school? And, and excuses don't work, right? Uh, the dog ate my homework? No, that's not good enough. There's no good excuse as to why 3,200 people groups are in this world without anybody coming with the gospel. Some of these places are in very hard, rugged, tough climates. It's very difficult to live. Uh, I knew a missionary in, on, the, on the Tibetan Plateau, the Himalayan Plateau, which is an average elevation of 16,000 feet. The highest I've ever been is 14,000 feet on Pikes Peak. And I thought I was going to pass out from, from the, low al the high altitude the low oxygen, but, but living up there is for rugged, rugged people. And if, you're, if, your, body's not, um, if your body's not able to, to absorb that or live in that kind of condition, you have to get off the mountain or you'll die from altitude sickness. So uh, some of these places are tough to live. Some of these places are illegal to live as a Christian. Uh, you can't go to Iran as a missionary. There's people groups in Iran that, are, that don't have the gospel. <clears throat> in spite of this, the work of God is going forward. I, I, I'll assure you of that. But these are sad terms, are they not? Are you with me so far? So let's look at where these un, unreached, unengaged people groups live. How many of you have never heard this phrase, the 1040 window? This is the first time you're hearing it. Wow, see several hands. 1040 window is the African, European, and Asian continents from the 10th parallel to the 40th parallel north. There's 67 countries in that window and about 4 billion over four billion people live in that window. And uh, my laser pointer doesn't work on a TV screen, but you can see to the far left over there, you're looking at the northern half, basically, of the African continent, and then the, um, uh, Central Asia, and then uh, Asia, South Asia, and then Eastern Asia. Uh, that's, the, that's, that's called the 1040 window. Now, uh, that's one third of the world's land mass, and it's two thirds of the world's people. So it's a highly concentrated population area. And 83% of the world's unreached people groups live in that window. Isn't that amazing? Uh, this, this window was uh, formed, this phrase was formed by a guy named Louis Bush in 1990 as he was seeking and researching and trying to figure out where people live who don't have the gospel. So over 3 billion people in the 1040 window that don't have the gospel and, and, and are still considered unreached. The three most powerful strongholds of the devil find their origin in this window. You know what the largest false religion is in the world? Islam with 1.85 billion people. Hinduism with 1.2. And Buddhism with over half a billion people. And I know you can't see it <clears throat> because of the size and I can't point at it. But right above the one where it says 1040, right above the one, 
just a little ways, is the nation of Israel. And, and if I can say it like this for the purpose of tonight, that's where Christianity was established. Jesus touched down on this earth, right? And surrounding that area is the darkest part of our world. The countries with the most unreached people groups are India. 2,445 unreached people groups. Uh, all the way down to Pakistan, China, Bangladesh, and Nepal. I want to show you some maps here to help, help us kind of get a picture of what this looks like. This is from joshuaproject.net, and I encourage you to go there and research it yourself. But joshuaproject.net has a scale to classify people groups from completely unreached to completely reached. So the, the, the dark green dot you see on the map, those dark green dots means this is a reached people group. They've, they've got the gospel. There's a good percentage of people there that are believers. The light green moves down the scale to not quite so thoroughly reached. And then you have the orange dot, and then you have the yellow dot, and then you have the red dot. And red dot means zero, unreached. Less than 2% even claim to be uh, Christian, uh, claim to be believers. So this is the map of Burkina Faso. And there's 80 people groups in this country, and 28 of them are still considered unreached. This is in Western Africa. Here's a map of Iran. And I said earlier, you think Iran is all Persian people, but there's several different people groups. You can see the red dots in Iran. Look at the red dots in Laos, 106 unreached people groups in Laos, 67 unreached people groups in Vietnam. Here's a map of Indonesia that has 789 people groups, and look at that, 472 of them still don't have scripture. Look at all those red dots. <clears throat> This is India, 2,445 unreached people groups. Now, there's a lot of Christian activity in India. When uh, Brother Ogle presented his video this morning, it, it showed that India is 2% Christian, and that remember that, what that word Christian means, right? So it's really a, a lot less than 2% are actually believers. Um, but but with, with 2%, if 2% of India are believers, that's a whole lot of people, right? because there's 1.4 billion people there. It's the most populated nation in the world now, past China, just a few months ago. But look how many unreached people groups are there. If you see, if you see there's a blank spot at the upper right end, you see it, the, the red dots going up, and there's a blank area right there. Can you see that? That's the country of Bangladesh. And there's the unreached people groups in Bangladesh, 301 of them, still waiting to hear the gospel. There's the whole 1040 window <clears throat> with the red dots identifying unreached people groups. See, here's the, here's the irony of this. When I was pastoring one time, I heard a young man say, God's called me to the ministry, and I'm just waiting for a position to open up. And I want to show him this map. There's 7,000 positions waiting for a preacher who will come somewhere and preach the gospel. Now, if we just take the 50 largest unreached people groups, all 50 out of the 7,000, all 50 in the top are over 10 million people. Now, I'm showing you this because I don't want you to think, well, when you say unreached people group, you're talking about 50 people sitting around a fire somewhere in, in a jungle, South America or Africa. No, the top 50 are over 10 million in population each. That's a lot of people. Um, six of them are over 50 million in population, and if you just take the 50 largest, you're going you're gonna to come up with a, a billion and a half people who are still unreached with the gospel. Every three minutes, 85 people die who never heard the gospel, and 210 babies are born into the unreached world. Can you see by that slide right there why we are not gaining ground in reaching the world? The status of the mission is not that more people are, that I, I think today there are more people saved than had ever been saved at any one time in history. But the world keeps growing. And the growth in population is exceeding the growth in the spread of the gospel. <clears throat> are you getting overwhelmed yet? <laughs> are you thinking this is too big of a task for us? I, I know that's the process, but hang in there. Robert Moffat said, in, and he died in 1883, but he said, in the vast plain to the north, in the morning sun, I've seen at different times the smoke of a thousand villages 
villages whose people are without Christ, without God, and without hope in the world. Let me tell you, if you're living in a place where the gospel hasn't come, and you don't have a Bible, and you don't even know who God is, you've never heard the name of Jesus Christ, you're without hope unless the church gets serious about finishing the mission. This is a profile from, it's actually a page out of a book called The Buddhist Peoples of the World, and this is a profile on the northern Kampa tribe of Tibet. And this is where I heard, I met and heard a missionary speak who lived in this part of the world. And I know it's too small to read, but in 2020, the population was 179,000 people in this one people group. And the missionary, by his own testimony, who had to leave because his wife was dying with altitude sickness, he said, uh, as far as he knew, there were two believers among these 179,000 people. So, would you agree with me that that number is unacceptable? Something should be done about that, shouldn't it? So, let's talk about missionaries now. How many missionaries are we sending out, and where are those missionaries going? There are 14,000 approximately, there are 14,000 independent Baptist churches in the world with a membership of two and a half million, and we're sending out about 4,500 missionaries. That's one missionary for every 3.1 churches, or one missionary for every 556 church members. Among Southern Baptists, and I'm, I'm just giving you statistics tonight, but there's 47,198 churches, and this comes right off of their own uh, statistical websites. Their membership is 13.2 million, and they have 3,511 missionaries. So that's one for every 13.4 churches, or one for every 3,759 members. So these Baptist churches that that claim to preach the true gospel, uh, we're only sending out uh, just over uh, 8,000 missionaries. That's not enough. That's not enough. Do you know that if if you could go someplace in the world and set up a gospel tent and preach and see 10,000 people saved tonight, tomorrow night you move to another place where they never heard of Jesus and you preach the gospel and 10,000 people get saved, and the next night you move to another place and 10,000 people get saved, and you keep moving that tent every single night, and every single night you see 10,000 people saved, do you know how long it would take to reach just the unreached people groups of the world? 967 years. 967 years. I I think we could do better than that, do you? Uh, The Moravian missionary movement of the 1700s, that wasn't an independent Baptist movement, but they were good people who loved God, and they they spread all over the world preaching the gospel. The Moravians at one point in the mid-1700s were sending out one missionary for every four church members. They were serious about this thing. I think we can do better. So where are our missionaries? Now, this is just independent Baptist missionaries, okay? This is a study done just a few years ago. 85% of independent Baptist missionaries are in 15 different countries. Do you remember the 1040 window and 83% of the world's unreached people groups live there? Uh, Here's the most common countries we go to. 30% of our missionaries are in five countries. We go to Brazil, Mexico, the United Kingdom, the Philippines, and Canada. That's the top five. And then 8% of independent Baptist missionaries are are working in the 1040 window. Now, let me clarify this because I don't believe the 1040 window is the only place missionaries ought to be going. If God calls a missionary to Brazil tonight, you ought to go to Brazil. Amen right there? If God calls you to the Philippines, you ought to go to the Philippines. There's lost people everywhere. Churches need to be planted everywhere. There's needy areas and needy peoples everywhere. But I'm I'm just illustrating a point here that if 83% of the world's unreached people live in the 1040 window and we're only sending 8% of our workforce there, maybe we need to look at our strategy a little bit. Maybe we need a strategy that targets the places in the world where no missionary has ever gone. Now, it's, it's, it's easy. I use the term easy, relatively speaking here, but you know why we keep sending missionaries to the same countries? Because it's easier to go where somebody else has already done the pioneer work. I've heard this testimony my whole life. A missionary will say, God's called me to, I'll just pick one of these countries, God's called me to the Philippines. So I'm going to go on the first four years in the Philippines, I'm going to work with veteran missionary, and he gives us a name. 
and I'm going to learn the culture, and I'm going to learn the language, and, and this is a good plan. I'm not being critical. This is a good plan. I'm going to serve an internship with somebody who's been there for a few years and learn how you plant churches in the Philippines. And then on my second term, I'm going to go a d to a different location, and I'm going to plant another church. That's a good plan. Would you agree with that? But you know, somewhere back down the line, there wasn't a veteran missionary to work with. Somebody had to go pioneer the work. Somebody had to go plant the first church and plow the ground where no one had, had worked before. It's a lot easier to go where there's already Bibles, there's already churches, and there's already missionaries. But we need the pioneer spirit of William Carey and, and Adoniram Judson and Robert Moffat in South Africa and Robert Morrison in China. We need that pioneer spirit uh, that we, we had for, for many years in the church. William Borden was a young man whose parents sent him on a trip around the world at the age of 16. That was his birthday present. Um, when my daughter turned 16, I thought about sending her away too, but we didn't. We kept her. <clears throat> but Robert Moffat went to, uh, <laughs> you have a 16-year-old? <laughs> when Robert Moffat was traveling around the world, he encountered a Muslim people group in China, and God broke his heart for them. So he came back, and he determined to go there as a missionary. He went to Cairo, Egypt to learn Arabic so he could go to China and reach these people, and he died in Cairo from meningitis. And concerning the unreached world, here's what William Borden said. If ten men are carrying a log, nine of them are at the little end, and one of them is at the heavy end, and you want to help move the log, on which end will you go? So I personally believe anybody who feels called to missions ought to consider the unreached world. Where can I go, as Paul said, striving to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named? Here's the solution, and we're going to bring this to a close. <clears throat> the solution, number one, is prayer. Now, here's where I hope you can get some hope. Being overwhelmed by the numbers and, and despondent that this is too big a job for us to do, here's the hope, okay? And you might be asking yourself, if, if, the, if all these people need the gospel, why don't we just develop a better strategy here? See, when Jesus saw the multitude scattered as sheep without a shepherd, he didn't say, he didn't say, now we've got to get better organized. Now, Peter, you get that section over there, James and John, the sons of thunder, you take this big section right here in the middle. And Andrew, you're good at bringing people to Jesus. You take that section over there. And come on, guys, let's get with it. We've got to do a better job. He didn't say that, did he? He said, he said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labors into his harvest. Now, why did he tell us to pray? Why was Jesus' first response to the scattered multitudes that needed a shepherd? Why was his first response to pray? Here's, I, I, I could preach a whole sermon right here, but listen, the mission of God is being carried on by the power of God, not the strategy of men. We must go to God because he is the author, the founder, and, and the motivator, and the carrier, uh, the one who's carrying out this, this mission of revealing his glory and extending his grace. God is the one who calls laborers to the field. I can give you sad stories Brother Ogle could come up here and tell you some sad stories. And, and we might could emotionally move somebody enough tonight that you just, your heart just breaks and you just say, I've got to be a missionary, I've got to go. But we can't call you to missions. But God can call you to missions. And here's what happens. <clears throat> a guy will go to visit a field somewhere and he sees the great need and he comes home with a broken heart. And he says, God, you need to send more missionaries to Afghanistan. Would you send missionaries to Afghanistan? And he begins praying this. He prays it every day because his heart broke at what he saw, and he just can't get over it. He can't get it out of his mind. And after three months or four months or five months of praying for God to send missionaries to Afghanistan, you know what God says? Why don't you go? That's another reason God told us to pray, because listen carefully. God gets his workforce from the prayer force. It is so highly unlikely that God would ever call a person to missions who hasn't been praying for God to send missionaries. It's just the way it works. Now, I know that scared you off right there, didn't it? 
Now you're afraid to pray for God to send missionaries because you're afraid he might send you. <laughs> uh, that, that maybe is not the best sales technique for, for missionaries, right? But God wants us to pray because when we, when we pray, it gets us on the same page with God. When you start praying for God's will to be done, you think he wants to send missionaries? Oh, yeah. When you start getting on the same page with God and you start wanting what God wants more than you want what you want, now God's got your heart in a place where he can use you. And it truly, ladies and gentlemen, is how God calls missionaries. Every, every church ought to be focused on praying for missionaries to be sent out of our local church. Maybe you have missionaries that have been sent out of here in the past. I don't know. But if this is God's mission, and this church exists to carry out God's mission, shouldn't we want to send our own to the unreached places of the world? The first part of the solution is to pray. Now, this is also highly encouraging because you're, you're looking at this, and you're overwhelmed by the numbers, and you think, how are we ever going to get this done? What could I do? That's what you can do right there. And it is the most effective tool. Prayer. I wish I had time to preach on that longer and convince us of that, but we must pray for unreached people groups and for God to send labors. My family years ago decided that every time we pray, we're going to say, Lord, please send more labors to the unreached fields of the world. And you might think, well, if you just say that at the end of your prayer, it's, it's just going to get to be a routine thing and kind of a meaningless cliche you add to the end of your prayer. Well, the, the, the answer to that is don't let it be meaningless. Pray it sincerely. And if we, if we think about how we pray now, we say a lot of things in our prayer that we just say out of habit. Am I, am I telling the truth? So every time you pray, just say, God send more labors to the unreached fields of the world. Nothing wrong with that. It's actual, actually obedience to the command of God because he told us to do it. Number two... Well, let me give you this quote first. Uh, Hudson Taylor said, We do well to remember that this gracious God who has condescended to place his almighty power at the command of believing prayer looks not lightly upon the blood guiltiness of those who neglect to avail themselves of it for the benefit of the perishing. I don't want to stand before God someday and him say, I couldn't even get you to care about who I cared about. I couldn't get you to pray for the people I was desperately wanting to to send a laborer to reach. Let's pray for laborers. Number two, the solution is passion. And that's what we looked at in Romans 15, 20 tonight at the beginning. The church needs the passion of the Apostle Paul. The church needs the passion that says, where is, listen carefully to this, I, I'm going to challenge you very plainly here tonight, but the church ought to say, where is the place in this world that this church can take responsibility to reach? This church can choose an unreached people group where there's no missionary. Say, by the grace of God, we're going to start praying for those people. And by the grace of God, we're going to ask him to call a missionary out of our church, if he can do it, if he will do it, if, if, if there's someone available. We're going to ask God to call a missionary to reach that particular people group. And we're going to stand before God someday at his throne with people from every kindred, tribe, and tongue. And we'll be able to look across the crowd and say, those people... We sent a missionary there. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Number three, <clears throat> part of the solution here is we need a plan. The good news is we don't have to come up with a plan because there's a Bible plan. Isn't that great? Here's the Bible plan, a church for every nation. Do you know what Matthew 28 19 tells us to do? Go plant a church in every people group. Go ye therefore and teach all ethnic groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe every, all things whatsoever I've commanded you. That's, that's winning, baptizing, and discipling people into a local body of believers. And teaching them to go win people and baptize them and disciple them into a local body of believers. That's church planting at its simplest form. One missionary friend of mine says, Matthew 28, 19 means you go, you go talk about Jesus and you... You, uh, you baptize them into the church and you teach them to go talk about Jesus and baptize people into the church and you teach them to go talk about Jesus and, and the process just continues. So we really don't want to plant a church. We want to start a church planting movement in every people group. 
So this is the biblical plan. Remember this slide? Uh, 14,000 independent Baptist churches, 47,000 Southern Baptist churches. Look at these numbers. That's 61,198 churches. That's one unreached people group for every 8.25 churches. This is where I hope to convince you that it's doable. If the church got serious about the Great Commission, we, we got eight churches for every one unreached group. We could get the job done. We could. So now we need discipleship in every church. I've already referred to Matthew 20, 19, 20, which is making disciples out of people. It's not just about winning them to Christ. It's about discipling them to become disciplers and go win others to Christ and train them to go win others to Christ. And the third part of that is we've got to have the Bible in their language so they can become disciplers among their own people. Remember this slide? 3,883 languages still without Scripture. Do you know that's one language for every 15.8 churches? Do you think God could call a Bible translator out of 16 churches? Surely there's somebody in 16 churches that God could reach into and pull out who would give their life to translating the Word of God for a people. This is, this is achievable. It is doable. The greatest missionary, Cameron Townsend said, is the Bible in the mother tongue. It needs no furlough. It is never considered a foreigner. So these are former missionaries. <coughs> they kind of have things in common. Number one, all these men were pioneers. They went to places the gospel hadn't been. The second thing they have in common is when they arrived at their field of service, they realized these people need the Bible. So they became Bible translators. And the third thing they all have in common is they all lived well over 100 years ago. Uh, the question is, who's replacing them? I, I believe that for the last 50 to 100 years, the evangelical church has ignored the need for the Word of God in the language of the people. And we have continue to send missionaries where there's already Bibles and there's already churches and there's already missionaries and we have lost the pioneer spirit and we need to get it back. We need the passion Paul talked about, striving to take the gospel where the gospel hasn't been. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, I do pray that you've overwhelmed our hearts tonight. And Lord, what we looked at is, is just such an astounding thing. But I hope we're encouraged that we can obey the Great Commission. We can do our part. Everybody in this room can pray for laborers. And perhaps you're calling a missionary here tonight. Uh, perhaps the call is beginning tonight and over the next few months and, and maybe even years, you're gonna send missionaries out of Temple Baptist Church. Lord, we pray for your will to be done. We do pray for you to send laborers to the unreached fields of this world. In Jesus' name.